Liel, I think we can start. Okay, great. I just received a few messages of people that ask about the password, so I need to send it to them. Okay, good afternoon again. Uh, over the last decades, the Middle East, and more specifically, East Mediterranean region, has experienced a rapid process of uh, desertification. There are connected uh, factors such as climate change, rapid population growth, and industrialization. Water has become increasingly scarce and is considered an expensive natural resource. Consequently, the area comprised of Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, the occupied Palestinian territories, and Syria makes up one of the most water scarce region in the world. This increased scarcity has significant political and socioeconomic impacts for the entire region. When states are water scarce, their food supply, public health, and economic growth are increasingly jeopardized without effective countermeasures. In water scarce areas, access to water is thus of key importance for economic prosperity, political stability, and the vitality of the civilian population. As a result, in those Eastern Mediterranean countries facing severe water scarcity, water has been framed as an existential threat, leading governments to use and justify emergency measures highly concentrated at the governmental and military level. This framing, in some way similar to uh, the current coronavirus pandemic, give the states a license to use exceptional measures to address the threat posed by water scarcity and to push major states infrastructure projects such as desalination projects or dams at the expense of local communities, natural streams and the general environment. In the case of transboundary water, a highly militarized and securitized framing bears the risk of encouraging unilateral management schemes that increase the risk of violent conflict and discourage cooperation. Another significant consequence of securitization, as in times of this growing pandemic, is that the urgency and emergency measures often lead to the exclusion of civil society, academia and research, and non-governmental organizations from the decision-making processes. With this in mind, we started a partnership around a year ago between Israel-Palestine Center for Regional Initiatives, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, and Euromesco, uh, in trying to examine the different policies in regarding to ensuring water uh, security in the region. In this process, we managed to bring together researchers and practitioners from the Middle East and from Europe to examine together uh, the different uh, approaches and implications of such phenomena. Uh, today, we will present the different chapters that we designed and created uh, over this year. And also in different chapters, we'll try to tackle uh, different similarities to the current uh, pandemic. Um, before starting with the chapter, I want to thank uh, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies and Shira Koranek to, uh, in their partnership. And of course, Euromesco, which in such a complex process of bringing all these researchers and practitioners together, and in the different sensitivities that came up with the regional politics, we managed to have a, a, a stable and coherent process and eventually to uh, publicize this important uh, uh, paper. I want to thank also Professor Itai Fischendler for his uh, uh, position as a reviewer and with working with all the, the writers in producing their own chapters. Before we move to the chapter, I want to uh, pass the microphone to Shira for uh, her views regarding the importance of this paper. Please, Shira. Thank you. Thank you, Liel. And I also want to echo your words and thanking all the authors who kind of embarked on this journey with us when we did uh, from the onset kind of push the structure, the standard structure of how these uh, joint policy studies happened in terms of partnering authors and expanding the diversity of the research team that we were convening around this question. And of course, Euromesco that enabled and supported us on all these uh, questions that we wanted to uh, explore together. Uh, when the issue of water security as a topic kind of bringing us all together around these common questions came up, very quickly uh, we wanted to introduce the processes of securitization and desecuritization. And at the beginning it was kind of challenging, not because these are terms unheard in research and academic processes in the Middle East, but because uh, trying to uncover what is the 
theme or the running thread that connects all the diverse questions we were asking about water and energy nexuses and the history of water and the policy recommendations when we kept trying to have a unified approach to these terms. Water security, securitization and desecuritization was quite challenging for us. And then now coming full circle at the end of a year process and seeing how relevant these issues are and how all of a sudden from these amorphous terms that were uh, an interesting analytical thought to how um, uh, acute there are they are globally now concerning the COVID-19 pandemic and how we see securitization processes happening so rapidly around us and we're kind of confronted to address these questions and using water as an example or a history of processes uh, that have happened uh, as an example of a natural resource has been so uh, historically security securitized has been really um, interesting for us as a group and we're very happy to now share this webinar where we're addressing these questions both excuse me reviewing the work that the authors have done and then showcasing how it's relevant now to the crisis we see around us so welcome everyone uh, we uh, are really happy to share the results of a year-long process and we welcome questions, so please uh, include them in the chat bar or the Q&A bar. And uh, after the presentations, we'll have ample time uh, to respond to people's questions. Um, Great, Shira. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll pass the microphone now to Dr. Christian Freulich, a research fellow from the German Institute of Global and Area Studies, which wrote the first chapter that deals with the theoretical background of securitization versus desecuritization. And it's titled Desecuritization of Water as a Key for Water Diplomacy. Please, Christian. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, Shira, for convening this. Thanks to uh, Euromasco and Iamed for um, making this happen. Uh, it's quite peculiar, isn't it? We were meant to uh, meet somewhere in the Jordan Valley, I think, <laughs> to, to do this presentation, but here we are. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about uh, securitization of water uh, and water security. So we've heard already about growing water scarcity in the Middle East and North Africa, and also of course in other regions in, in the world. Um, and this growing water scarcity globally or regionally, it doesn't really matter really lets water resources seem like a natural target of securitization processes. So what is securitization? Securitization is the presentation of a reference object, in our case, water security or access to enough water um, as an existential threat for a specific audience, let's say the Palestinian society or the Israeli society. And if that um, process is successful. So if the audience accepts the securitization, then it's successful securitization, which legitimates um, exceptional measures of addressing this existential threat. So it allows politics to go out of the normal toolbox of politics, basically. So this is what, what we're talking about. Um, this is especially true, or these patterns are especially true or especially, um, um, yeah, uh, overt, let's put it that way, where water scarcity combines with political conflict and with adversity, for instance, in international water basins like the Jordan Basin, but there are several other um, examples around the world. Now, while international so-called water walls are unlikely. So walls between nation states about water, that's simply not very economical. Uh, Sub-state water conflicts have become quite common, even though they don't necessarily have to be violent. Not always are they violent. Sometimes they are, of course. Climate change comes in addition to this and exacerbates all these dynamics, bringing water security to uh, the forefront. Uh, of both academic and policy discussions. My chapter now looks at securitization and desecretization patterns to better understand how identities, collective identities uh, are constructed because this is relevant if you want to understand conflict mechanisms. It is um, to better understand what is sayable and unsayable. So now we're going into discourse. What, what are the things that are taboo and what are the things that 
maybe were to do and are now possible to say because discursive boundaries have been expanded. Um, and to better understand how groups are included or excluded from water security or water rights. Um, the chapter outlines these kinds of patterns uh, for the Israeli and the Palestinian discourses. And now I only have a very limited amount of time, so I can't go into the, the details of the different discourses. But I think what's the most crucial thing in understanding, not only for the Israeli-Palestinian discourse, but for water securitization more generally is the underlying understanding of security, which differs for hegemonic discourses and for so-called counter discourses that are a little bit less powerful yet. Uh, they might become more powerful in the future. So, because this points to the future and this points to possible solutions. So the key question for us really needs to be whose security, who whose security are we talking about when we talk about securitization patterns? Is it national security? Because this question really determines who then addresses the risk that has been identified for a specific audience. So is it national security? So a national territory or a national population that should be secured from a, from a threat? Is it international security? So more an international, uh, the international system of uh, states and organizations? Is it maybe human security? So is it mankind that should be secured from a potential uh, threat? Or is it even broader uh, ecological security? So the whole planet with all living beings. And depending on which kind of security is underlying uh, the securitization patterns um, really uh, decides what tools are used to address the threat. Um, so this is very, very briefly about uh, the chapter. Um, we can maybe go into more detail in the Q&A, but I wanted to talk a little bit in the remaining time about uh, five questions that we've discussed uh, before um, coming together here um, to, um, yeah, in part, talk about the parallels between the situation we find ourselves in right now and um, the water security issues that we've seen over decades and how they've developed. So um, when we ask how can water securitization be exemplified through securitization trends concerning COVID-19, I would answer the, that we, we are really talking about very similar mechanisms. So the beauty the analytical beauty of securitization is that the mechanism is always the same. The referent object changes, but um, the, the mechanism is always the same. So in this case, the referent object is presented as an existential threat for a specific audience. And if accepted, it justifies exceptional measures. Like uh, as we've seen in some places uh, with regard to COVID-19, an authoritarian turn in politics. And this um, is, a parallel that we've also seen in, in uh, some places uh, in the world with regard to water. Of course, it could also go the other way um, and it could also lead to desecretization, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, then the second question was, how will the current crisis impact the secretization of water and other natural resources? Is it a challenge or uh, an opportunity? I think that the level of securitization really corresponds to um, discursive boundaries. So the more securitization we have, the more exceptional measures are legitimized, which push the boundaries of what is stable or unstable. But it does work both ways, as I mentioned before. So um, desecretization, which I think today we would often say is um, more fact-based, a little bit level-headed, uh, more or level-headed, more level-headed um, objective can bring values like empathy, like compassion, etc., to the forefront of dominant discourses and push discursive boundaries in that sense by showing um, or by, by uh, identifying that the pandemic has really shown um, in a way that is unprecedented, uh, I think, how connected we all are and how affected and similarly affected we are by the situation um, that we are in our, right now. Um, 
then how will the crisis impact the perceptions around regional agreements and transboundary partnerships? This is, of course, really relevant for, um, for water security discussions. What we see right now in many places is a trend to nationalization. This had been happening before COVID, but it's, it's um, on the forefront right now. And if this continues, I think regional and transboundary efforts may take a severe hit. Um, however, we don't know yet what the extent will be. I'm not sure whether it will um, uh, destroy uh, regional agreements like for the Nile, for instance, or between Jordan and Israel. I'm not sure about that. But of course, um, yeah, the, there's always a risk. Um, and then finally, uh, we had the question, how will the economic crisis and the economic care packages that have been put on by the different national governments um, impact pollution or the general water scarcity in the region? And I think this is a, a really good question because it shows that there's actually, a, right now, there's a chance to reconfigure um, national and transnational economic systems um, to tackle climate change impacts. Because now we see what's possible um, with much less of a, uh, of a carbon footprint, um, much smaller carbon footprint than we had before. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it shows that there's much more, hi, <laughs> there's much more um, wiggle room than I think um, politics wanted us to believe or believe itself. Um, and it really shows the potential for uh, where we could go when this crisis is over and we restart uh, national economy. And that's it for me. Thank you very, very much, Christian. I think uh, yeah, your presentation, also the chapter in general, is very uh, critical in uh, highlighting an important question about the security of whom. Do we speak about security in the national level, of those governing the, the government, of this maybe in many countries an elite that is disconnected from the general population that lives around the water sources? Or we speak about the security of communities that live around the water sources. So we, 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 we you, many times we say security, but we don't say security of whom. And the process of securitization, desecuritization uh, lies on that specific question. If it's security of everyone, we need to uh, organization that represent the local communities. However, if it's security on the national level, maybe those uh, uh, centralized institutions are those to make the decisions. Uh, but all of this will leave to the to the open discussion of later. So thanks again. Um, I'd, li I'd like now to to present the second chapter, which is very important, and it's it's presenting how acute the situation is regarding the water in the Middle East. It was written by uh, Mr. Tobias Van Losso and Dr. Mahmoud Shatat. Uh, Tobias Van Losso is a research fellow for Kelin Gedel. Uh, from the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, and Mahmoud uh, Shatat um, is from uh, Oxford Institute. Um, Tobias, uh, be happy to present uh, your chapter, but also try to discuss how this uh, securitization issue shaped the, um, the level of water or the scarcity of water in the local level in comparison to other uh, uh, centralized governmental level. Uh, please, Tobias, if uh, stage is stage, the stage is yours. Sweet, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, good afternoon also from uh, from my side. Um, uh, yeah, as you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, together with Mahmoud, we basically wrote the introductory, kind of introductory chapter when it comes to the water scarcity, the level of water scarcity. And um, under the title Less and Less, which already indicates um, in which direction we are heading, uh, it is more or less basically to highlight the broader trends in the region um, and to set the stage for the overall uh, discussion. So in that sense, we uh, were not using so much the term of, uh, security, but rather conflict, uh, so a bit uh, avoiding uh, this uh, discussion, but uh, the, with the main aim basically to highlight uh, the various types of interlinkages that we have uh, between security on the one hand and water water scarcity, water availability um, on the other. 
So when we talk about uh, talking about water and water scarcity in the Middle East, um, it's clear that shortages and scarcity is nothing new at all. Um, we see uh, physical water scarcity, uh, the, the physical absence of water, particularly on the uh, Arabian Peninsula, but we also see economic water scarcity, uh, which basically means that there are water resources available, additional resources exist, but authorities, usually the state, but also other water providers, are not able to make these resources available due to financial uh, lack of financial resources, lack of knowledge, institutional capacity, or also political will. Um, insufficiently maintained water infrastructures, mismanagement, uh, poor water governance, non-governance are uh, complementing to the, to the situation. So today the Middle East is the most water scarce region in uh, the world and the amount of water available today is expected to happen within the next uh, 30 to 40 years. So almost two thirds of the population in the region live under conditions of high or very high water stress, particularly in the rural areas, but also urban water systems are increasingly under pressure. Um, on top of it, we see several drivers that are increasing the gap of uh, water demand and water supplies. Um, on the one hand, we see uh, a rising water demand due to population growth, birth rates, but also um, through immigration. We see economic development and rising living standards, uh, which increase the water consumptions. On the other hand, we see decreasing water supplies uh, due to climate change, rising sea levels, prolonged and intensified droughts, but also less predictable rainfall. So in that overall situation of an increasing demand and uh, decreasing supplies, that of course leads to increasing an increase of uh, competition and conflict over water resources among the various users. So looking into this, uh, yeah, as I said, looking into that uh, complex um, framework of water and, and, and conflict, um, we had two main dimensions uh, that we looked at. The first is uh, water scarcity and how water scarcity is fueling conflict. Um, so we can see that, for instance, the conflicts against the, uh, the mentioned background over distribution, utilization and control of water resources um, is increasing and it has the potential to destabilize um, certain regions or even countries. It is, of course, debated and contested what role exactly these kind of uh, scarcity plays. But even if, let's say, there's a, a a greater responsibility on, on, on the governance side. It is, let's say, the change of the water situation in the first place um, is the event that triggers a certain uh, reaction on the ground or also would require an appropriate uh, govern government um, response. Uh, we see uh, that, for instance, also in anti-state protests, as in the Basra 2018 and 2019, but also in Beirut um, last year, water was, of course, not the main, the main issue. Uh, that those protests were based on a broader discontent with the government, but it did play a role along with insufficient electricity supplies. Um, we also found the dire living conditions uh, in, the, in the region make it easier for extremist groups uh, to recruit uh, fellows on the ground, to gain support on the ground, as for instance, ISIS uh, benefited from droughts in northern Iraq uh, in, uh, from 2011 onwards. Um, and uh, we also see, of course, the, that interstate conflicts over water um, are intensifying, uh, as for example, between Turkey and Iraq along Euphrates and Tigris, um, or along the Nile between Egypt and Ethiopia. The second dimension we looked at was, uh, let's say, the whole uh, link vice versa. Um, it was how conflict, um, how politics and fragility um, is impacting uh, the water situation, how it aggravates water um, scarcity. So in the first place, first place very easily, the security and economic situation prevents in plenty of uh, cases that uh, water-related challenges are appropriately addressed. Uh, second, we see damages um, uh, of water infrastructures. I Iraq is a very good example. So the Iran-Iraq war, the first U.S. intervention, the second U.S. intervention, the um, uh, corresponding U.S. occupation, and also the expansion of ISIS uh, left uh, an already, let's say, outdated water infrastructure system more and more, um, more and more run down. 
and uh, basically it requires it hasn't it hasn't been uh, done that much of the last uh, 30 years. We also see that, um, of course, uh, ins insufficiently maintained infrastructures can also be a result of, of sanctions or uh, limited access to spare parts, um, as we see uh, in, in Palestine, but also in Iraq during the 1990s. Um, another uh, another um, dimension that we looked at was the water, the use of water as a weapon. So the use of water as a strategic political tool um, or as a military tool, such as in Syria and Iraq, but also in Yemen and Libya, has seen some kind of uh, renaissance uh, over the last uh, over the last 10 years. So water is used uh, in order to achieve political or military goals. Uh, last but not least, uh, also conflict-related migration um, does play a role. Uh, the most prominent example here is Jordan. Um, Jordan underwent uh, an, a tremendous population growth of 87% between 2004 and 2015, a large share due to immigration, uh, mainly refugees from Iraq and from Syria. So as a result, water availability also shrank in Jordan, previously uh, relatively well off when it came to, to water availability. Water availability uh, drastically um, shrank and uh, also Jordan today is among the countries uh, with uh, the least water resources available. So to uh, make that a bit more concrete and illustrative, we also added uh, the case study of Gaza, so which raises uh, at first a very good question, why Gaza? Uh, at the first glance, uh, Gaza is a pretty unique case against the Palestinian-Israeli context and it's not necessarily representative for the water situation in the region. But on a second glance, uh, Gaza being, of course, a very extreme case, does feature a lot of the prevalent and sometimes symptomatic regional trends. And the dire uh, water and humanitarian situation, and a lot of the humanitarian situation is related to the water situation, um, gives also a certain warning um, in what direction the whole region might go in the, in the future if today's water challenges are not adequately addressed. So the hydrological situation in Gaza is, uh, is really dire. It's in one of the most densely populated areas worldwide. Uh, about 96% of the available groundwater, and groundwater is the only water resource, is not uh, suitable for human consumption. 90% of the households uh, have to buy uh, water, usually from not uh, licensed private vendors. Also, climate change does play a role, but and uh, beyond uh, prolonged droughts, it's uh, also particularly the sea level rise that increases and accelerates the process of saltwater intrusion into the coastal aquifer, Gaza's only water resource. Um, water infrastructure being attacked during violent escalations is also prevalent in Israel. Uh, in in between, between in the escalations between Israel and Palestine is also prevalent in Gaza. And as already mentioned, the restrictions, the Israeli restrictions on the material imports prevent also infrastructure, new infrastructure, from being developed in uh, the occupied territories. Um, governance and water management issues are, of course, also playing a role. Uh, here also the internal divide and the limited coordination between the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah and the authorities in the Gaza Strip do play a role. We have overlapping uh, um, structures. We have They are partly um, competing, uh, partly working together. It's uh, a big problem because uh, the actual challenges are hardly addressed. And last but not least, also uh, desalination. Um, in Gaza is, uh, uh, let's say, um, an, an important dimension that also applies for the whole Middle East. Um, we will see, and we do see on the Arabian Peninsula uh, already today, that desalination will be one of the key elements to address the water crisis when it comes at least to drinking water for the, for the households. And uh, we also see uh, that particularly in Gaza, we have the, we have the potential there, um, but uh, due to uh, political and security uh, situation, uh, uh, let's say a major breakthrough could not have been achieved. We see 250 mostly small and medium-sized brackish water and seawater desalination plants, but uh, plans and ideas to build a larger desalination plan for Gaza have been uh, on the table already for quite a while. So uh, to uh, yeah, sum up with the, with the Gaza case, it is maybe the 
case with the highest level of uh, politicization and securitization uh, of water in the in the region, uh, which also basically uh, was the reason why we included it. So there are plenty of, uh, to conclude, there are plenty of uh, measures um, required and needed um, in various policy fields, um, transboundary cooperation that needs to be stepped up, policy changes and uh, also policy planning and technological innovation that is needed to address uh, the water challenge. Um, we basically just, uh, the main finding of our chapter was basically that the whole situation that to none of us is really new um, is actually deteriorating year by year if you look back particularly over the last of the last 20 years thank you very much tobias <laughs> um, i really liked reading your chapter but also here um, i think in the combination between the two chapters something very important arises and it's how security of one side can undermine the security of other and if we think of the security of Israel, it can undermine the water security of Gaza. And you manage in this chapter to put this like uh, in a very clear uh, way that I think will be very central in our uh, later dialogue about uh, how we can move within a securitized uh, discourse and still uh, ensure water security. Um, okay, I would like now to, uh, thanks again to Bia, so I'd like now uh, to invite uh, Dr. Ali Auguste de Rios, he's an assistant professor of international relations in TOBB, the University of Economics and Technology in Ankara. Uh, he wrote the third chapter about watering down tensions and the role of securitization in water cooperation or even water diplomacy uh, in the region. Uh, please, Ali. Uh, thank you, Liane, and um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I have a small presentation, if I may, uh, to share and uh, about my chapter. And um, it's about the, uh, it's entitled Watering Down Tensions, basically the role of securitization in uh, water-related cooperation. And uh, basically, uh, the outline of the chapter, which... Um, um, also covers part of the securitization and desecuritization, but then we look at how there's the uh, ability to cooperate because of or despite of securitization. There are two different hypotheses that I identify. And then uh, regardless of which hypothesis, um, the role of uh, civil society, which has some potential to develop, but has been underutilized is uh, discussed, but the role of the civil society is the same, whether it's because of securitization or uh, because of desecretization that collaboration uh, is likely to happen depending on which hypothesis. Then there are two cases that I uh, assess. The first one is the Red Sea to Dead Sea conveyor, and the other one is the uh, Turkey-Israel Water for Peace Initiative. None of them are really successful, but um, they were included for because they have had sustained dialogue and certain level of progress and agreements were achieved at various stages um, with them. And then uh, we discussed the role of uh, civil society and how more potential there can be for them. I will keep the uh, COVID-19 questions to the end. So let me go forward, yes, this is an example of the Ataturk Dam in Şanlıurfa, Turkey. And uh, based, we look at how our chapter explore, explores uh, cooperation and I dwell on attempted cooperation. But, uh, and the reason why I look also by uh, at these, these attempts, uh, there is a, they are characterized by a lack of uh, civil society. Well, civil society has an important influence and role, whether it's for desecretization or for securitization. And to give an example, my university in Ankara, well, we have a very strong uh, animal rights activist group, and uh, it's probably harder to remove one of the stray dogs who live on campus than to remove anyone else from the university. So uh, that's why civil society is important. But um, in, there are few evidences of uh, intergovernmental cooperation under the COVID-19, whereas this is a time where we probably need more 
civil society, there are challenges and opportunities which I will discuss uh, after the uh, conclusion. So um, what the securitization's role, I'm not gonna dwell too much because Christian, uh, she uh, explained that in detail about securitization that we take the Cop Copenhagen school, how they view at it. So I will very quickly uh, skip to the ability to cooperate under um, securitization. Well, governments, as we uh, often disagree on the usage, volumes, flows, responsibilities, how to share the water. And this is actually a problem, not just in the Middle East, it's in most parts of the world because they are viewed as a matter of national security. And of course, triggered by scarcity, they cause uh, lack of trust, further resource nationalism, uh, et cetera. But uh, the competing hypotheses that I tried to identify then, if we want to have to improve things, if we want to have governments at least to reach a modus vivendi, a temporary agreement, the, the first rationale would be that they can cooperate despite securitization. So we need a desecuritization, basically. That's the first hypothesis. Whereas the second hypothesis is that they will cooperate because of securitization, that because of the urgency of the matter, governments will set aside their differences and start cooperating. Um, and we, we have some examples of that as well. Now, uh, but regardless of which one, the role envisaged for a civil society is the same. Uh, it's one of, uh, or similar, it's one of influence. Now, as I uh, said earlier, the case of Water for Peace and Red Sea Dead Sea Conveyor were chosen as some of the regional initiatives, even though they're not successful uh, to say, is for three main reasons. Well, first, they both involve Israel at the heart of uh, many water-related uh, issues. They are both, you know, they were attempted at various periods of time and they sustained an endured dialogue for many years. And which is for the first, third reason, they can both be potentially reinitiated or revived. And that's quite encouraging. And uh, of course, they were uh, initiated by uh, the governments. So, and they were involved by civil society, but later on and relatively uh, weak in that sense. So I think there's further uh, opportunity for uh, civil society to be involved in that. And um, of course, I'm not gonna go too much on the refugees stressing, Tobias also mentioned that. But um, basically, very briefly, the Water for Peace was an initiative to actually transport and sell water from Turkey to Israel and also to Palestine. And the rationale was actually the governments of the time, both of Turkey and Israel wanted to promote regional peace and security. So that was the rationale behind it rather than commercial. Commercial was there, but it was probably secondary. And for the uh, and for the uh, for both and uh, the Red Sea to Dead Sea conveyor is a project where uh, because the Dead Sea is shrinkage, there will be a, a conveyor to transport water uh, from the Red Sea to back to to Dead Sea to avoid that uh, problem, so that it would not shrink like the Lake Aral. Now, um, so they were both, both projects were initiated by the, uh, at government level. Uh, King Abdullah II was uh, first on, uh, hands on involved for the Red Sea Dead Sea. And uh, in Turkey, President Özal was involved for the uh, Water for Peace. But uh, we have, uh, so these were top down initiatives, but now th there were attempts or uh, involvements bottom up um, for dialogue, to sustain dialogue. And I think that's still possible. And there are some ongoing, maybe not on those specific cases, but there's still um, the Turkish Union of Chambers and Commodities still has a industry for peace initiative going on, still as an option on the table in Jenin. Uh, and uh, there are similar attempts made to revive these initiatives. 
And uh, well, civil society can act as a gatekeeper, not, not just as the power to influence, but also it can contribute to capacity building. So maybe through IGOs and intergovernmental organizations and other NGOs, but it can help for capacity building, logistical support, funding, especially private funding, to channel funding towards these uh, projects. And um, so civil society has a multifaceted role that can still be played in addition to raising awareness, uh, etc. So the conclusion was that there were, though we don't have a clear success, there were important uh, progress and an agreement was actually signed in the Water for Peace. It was not, although no water was transported, an agreement was signed between Turkey and Israel and the facilities were built, $150 million facilities were built on the Manalgat River. So even though it will take a long-term societal change, there is still, civil society represents a way for citizens to influence decision-making and that can still play a part for uh, future cooperation. Now, back to the uh, questions. Now, how I wanted to relate this to the COVID-19 questions. Well, unfortunately, I'm not very, I'm, I'm cautiously, I'm cautiously optimistic or quite a uh, little pessimistic, shall I say, because of, well, the self-help situation. <laughs> yes, there is a self-help situation. And the current, what we've seen of countries grabbing each other masks in airports is not very encouraging in terms of uh, cooperation. Okay, the Turkish government has, is sending aid to 60 countries. That's one example, but... Uh, we don't see a huge example of uh, cooperation. Most of the time we see on the contrary are, uh, as you can probably see, they are national campaigns. So it's this, even as a global threat like COVID-19, the threat is global, but a lot of the measures are national. It's to save the national health system. There's a national campaign. This is from Jordan or from France uh, in, Tur in Turkey. But there are other opportunities. Um, one of them is, well, it's not all negative as well. We have, I think, two important opportunities. First is the low energy prices. I think uh, Christian and Tobias both mentioned this, and I agree on it. Low, in fact, the International Energy Agency just published the only form of energy whose demand is increasing in this in current stage are the renewables. Prices of oil have crashed. Many of the prices of uh, energy, demand for conventional energy has uh, uh, fallen. But we also have an increase for demand of renewables and we have the opportunity of low interest rates. A lot of uh, interest rates are low. So uh, I have prepared um, based on, this is my personal uh, incentive, but there can be ways for civil society to channel uh, transition and online services to green businesses to develop renewables for the opportunities that are, that may be more positively seen because of COVID as opposed to petroleum or other opportunities more negatively affected. I'm going to, I think I'm out of time, I think. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I have the other, some of the other questions for the, of the five questions, I'm going to keep them for the Q&A. And uh, yeah. thank you very much, Ali. Uh, you know that you put a lot of effort in this chapter, and uh, I think it's uh, very important in really highlighting how important it is to involve civil society in order to really have a, a stable uh, uh, process and hopefully a more su successful one. Uh, I, I think also your point regarding uh, the decrease of uh, globalization or even the, the, the expansion of national tendencies in regarding to confronting uh, COVID-19 is uh, also very essential in other works that I've seen and other discussions that I've been in where they said that uh, it's the rise of the national level and it's a question how uh, much we'll manage to promote even a regional level in, in promoting the COVID-19. But we can see in different uh, examples from across the world, the rise of regional institutions. Uh, so maybe it's globalization minus, but localization plus into regionalism. And it's a question how we we'll manage to, to bring it to the Middle East where the regional uh, institutions are a bit weak 
uh, if they exist even. So I'd like to move now to the, the last chapter that we published. Uh, it was uh, written by Dr. Julia Giordano from uh, ECOPIS, the International Affairs Manager at ECOPIS Middle East, and Dr. Desiree Qualiarotti, a researcher in the Itali Italian National Research Council, uh, Institute for Studies on the Mediterranean. Uh, the chapter is titled The Water Energy Security Nexus in the Middle East. Um, Please, Julia, I'm sure that you have a lot uh, to bring in from your experience working in Ecopeace and from this paper. So thank you, Liel, and uh, hi to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. So uh, the work that uh, Dr. Pajarotti and I have done focused on understanding and describing the interlinkages that exist uh, between two very important resources, water and energy in the particular context of the Middle East. Now, um, as it has been explained already uh, abundantly uh, by the other authors, the importance of water in the region and how the scarcity of water has led to, uh, can lead, can trigger instability, social discontent. So our objective was to understand, first of all, what, are, what is the linkage that connects these two resources, water and energy, and then what is the linkage that through the securitization theory uh, um, lenses uh, connects water and energy nexus to security. So first of all, uh, the, the, the nexus between water and energy can appear basically very, it's very evident. Uh, the two resources are uh, interconnected uh, in different ways. The water is part of energy production and energy is a fundamental resource for uh, production, withdrawal of water, distribution, conveyance. So this element is uh, um, evident. And it's particularly evident in the Middle East region because of water scarcity and uh, the, the use of uh, what we can call today non-conventional water sources. So production of uh, water through desalination requires high levels of um, energy. Uh, we, um, uh, we saw that at least 15% of the uh, consumption uh, of electricity national, nationwide in the Middle East is devoted to uh, the water cycle. Um, the, other, uh, um, the other direction is uh, true as well. So uh, water is a part, um, um, part of the uh, cycle of production of, of electricity. Uh, just think about the cooling process that is necessary for production of, uh, of electricity. So um, once this is clear, uh, it should be clear also that the approach that governments and uh, the policy uh, makers towards these two resources should be an integrated approach. Uh, unfortunately today, uh, these two resources are managed uh, separately, uh, considered also the, different, the, the, the asymmetries that characterize each resource. Uh, this lack of integration uh, bring also uh, a trade-off or um, uh, complications in the, in the management of the water energy nexus, uh, in particular in, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, where the two resources are uh, extremely connected, but also uh, treated as uh, they are, there are uh, elements in the, in the governance of these two resources that uh, contribute to further complicated the situation, like for example, subsidies in the production of, uh, in, in, the, in the prices of, of water and energy as well. When we add the dimension of security into the discourse, uh, the uh, complications uh, arise even more, even farther. So in we, it's very evident uh, that competition over resources, especially if the resources are scarce, can lead to instability. So Tobias mentioned before that uh, scarcity of water, scarcity of electricity can contribute to exacerbate already existing um, trends of discontent towards uh, the government. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, particularly evident in the case of water. We can look at the Israeli-Palestinian case, but we can look at many other cases. Uh, he mentioned the Nile case uh, and, and so on in the Middle East and also worldwide. Uh, also, when we look at energy, also energy has seen uh, energy insecurity can be seen as um, as a as a threat to the national uh, security of states because the impact of energy insecurity can have 
uh, repercussions on the economy and different other sectors. When we look at what the um, securitization uh, theory um, uh, describes, when the, the securitization theory describes the process of making um, an issue, a security threat, we tried to analyze whether there is already a recognition of, uh, an, uh, of the nexus existing between water and energy and whether that nexus has been securitized. That means we know that water issues have been highly securitized and this has uh, led to different consequences. We know that energy insecurity is also perceived as a threat to the national security. What happens when governments, civil society and different stakeholders recognize that uh, there is a nexus and this nexus is securitized. That means basically that uh, looking at these two elements and knowing that it, one element, one component of this nexus, if one component of this nexus is threatened, uh, then the whole nexus basically uh, is threatened too. So if there is a, a, a menace to water security, uh, this could lead to energy insecurity and the other way around. To give you an example, so that it's more clear, it's a, it's a little bit cerebral at this point, but to give you an example of what it means. Uh, let's go back to the case of Gaza. As Tobaya mentioned, this is a very important case that exemplifies how the connection bet what, between water and energy uh, and its nexus has been securitized by different stakeholders and different actors. Uh, there is a scarcity of water uh, as uh, uh, Tobias mentioned, dire uh, humanitarian situation, 97% of natural water is not potable. Uh, therefore, uh, water needs to be treated and needs to be produced. And this requires electricity. Uh, electricity, though, in, in Gaza has been an, a, an incredible problem for, for many, many years. And this due to internal Palestinian issues between uh, Ramallah and, and Gaza, uh, and also the blockade on, uh, from the Israeli side. So when we look at what happens in Gaza is that there is a possibility to produce water if there is electricity. So electricity uh, is um, a very important component here of, uh, of water security uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. And this has been recognized by the actor in, in, the, in the Palestinian arena, but has also been recognized by the Israeli actors. And here, to come back to what Christian has mentioned as the how the securitization process happens. It's a, it's a process that implies the presence of a securitizing actor that pronounces a sort of securitizing speech and uh, the audience can accept it or not. So uh, if we look at what happened a few years ago, uh, it, it happened continuously, but a few years ago specifically, uh, there was uh, an electricity crisis in, in Gaza, and, and this has led to uh, a huge uh, issue with uh, sanitation because uh, water that the, the sewage that uh, two million people living in Gaza were producing could not be treated la uh, due to lack of electricity to power the treatment plants. Uh, so this can, uh, can lead to severe uh, health, uh, public health repercussions in Gaza, but also in the neighboring countries, so also in Egypt and in Israel especially. Uh, when this has been recognized, when the nexus between uh, electricity, water security, and national reg uh, regional security has been recognized, uh, the key, uh, the, 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 the element that we, we, we saw was uh, how the, 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 the transfer of the discourse to another level. So, uh, just to, uh, to, to, to give you an example, uh, Netanyahu, a few years ago, uh, announced the, uh, the, the, the involvement of Turkey uh, to uh, start, uh, um, uh, to, to contribute to the sanitation crisis in, uh, uh, in Gaza. And it justified this uh, uh, momentary, uh, uh, let's say, um, restart of relations with Turkey by saying, by announcing to, uh, to the world and to the Israeli uh, public especially, the importance of this element. The fact that uh, it is important to tackle the sanitation issues in Gaza, because if there is a, uh, an outbreak of a 
of a, of a virus, in that case, it was referring to cholera, it was referring to typhoid, this will not stop at the fence. It will uh, go, uh, it will affect also the communities that in Israel that are located around uh, Gaza. Uh, and in this way, he pronounced a securat securat securatizing speech, uh, basically moving, transferring the issue of water and electricity to a very high level uh, military uh, uh, sphere. Uh, there are uh, pros and cons in, uh, in, this, uh, in this aspect. Uh, of course, this, as, as Christian uh, mentioned, uh, can lead to the exclusion of different stakeholders like civil society. But on the other side, it can also accelerate the process of uh, looking into these issues. So uh, once the issue of water and energy has been seen as essential to the national security of Israel, this has contributed to move forward with uh, resolving the electricity side on the Israeli side, on the, 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 Israel, the electricity problem from the Israeli side. So there is also this element of pushing forward. Uh, in general, the, the recognition of, of, a, of a nexus between uh, water, energy, and security uh, is, uh, is, is important and can lead to, to both uh, the strengthening uh, the, the, the securitization and therefore uh, the transfer of this uh, uh, discourse to another level, and can also uh, facilitate uh, other processes because uh, once uh, it's recognized the importance of these two elements, uh, this can also prompt cooperation uh, at, the, at the governmental level, especially, and can lead to uh, the creation of new agreements, for example, electricity agreement, water agreements. Um, finally, the, uh, the recommendation that we came out uh, with, uh, Dr. Quayerotti and I, was to uh, look at the importance of this nexus and creating also a switch in our mindset, uh, in the way we approach these issues. We should think in a nexus way, in an integrated way. And this can lead to opportunities. In particular, when we look at the opportunities that come from uh, the use of non-conventional water sources and renewable energies. Uh, if we use re renewable energies, we can turn uh, this uh, cycle of uh, that for now is a, is a sort of vicious cycle between water, energy, national security, and the exclusion of stakeholders into a virtuous cycle uh, where uh, renewable energy can uh, also, uh, they can contribute to the production of water uh, that uh, therefore contributes to water security, national security. And this can also lead to opportunities for cooperation within the region between different actors. Just to mention, uh, our organization uh, has uh, published a report uh, um, analyzing the opportunity to an, of, of an exchange of water and energy between the Jordan, Israel, and, and, uh, and Palestine, showing how this nexus can also be an opportunity to not only secure environmental security in the region, so water and environmental security, but also to ensure cooperation and to foster uh, diplomatic relations between the three countries. Uh, with regard to the COVID-19 issues, and I'll close because I think I'm uh, talking too much, uh, just a few thoughts. Um, I, I, I don't think I can go into uh, all the, the, the details regarding the securitization and what happens uh, today due to the, to the regulations that the emergency uh, approach that governments has uh, worldwide adopted. Uh, but related to the water and energy nexus, there is a direct connection. Uh, that we can recognize. Uh, we have recently published a report uh, that shows uh, uh, that there, there are studies that um, prove that the, the virus COVID-19 can survive in aquatic environment and also in, uh, in, uh, in a human uh, uh, feces and urine. That means that we can find the, found, the virus was found in sewage. Now, so far, it hasn't been proved that we can get sick from, from, the, from contact with sewage, but uh, studies are still continuing. Uh, what, it's, uh, uh, what we should think uh, about is securing uh, the, the, the treatment of wastewater, especially in a region like, uh, uh, like ours, where wastewater treatments usually uh, have a very low level of treatment or they're not enough to treat all the sewage produced in the, 
in the country. So we should think about um, the importance of securing water and energy for treatment of sewage. And I think I'm, I'm finished for now. Thank you very much, Julia. It's always very interesting to hear your thoughts about this topic. I know that for years you are involved in it and uh, every time you bring new highlights from your involvement and it's very, very interesting, specifically with this chapter and specifically with this work. I think the, the most important thing is the point that we cannot speak about water alone. Uh, we need to integrate it with other topics. And then the question of security is expanding. Uh, and of course, we need also to involve other sectors. There is the combination of, of uh, private public initiatives around energy and around water. And uh, all of this uh, really put question mark about the centralized, securitized processes that are usually being uh, promoted in regards to facing water uh, uh, security. So thank you again for writing this and, and for being here with us. Uh, today. Uh, I would like to pass it now to Professor Itai Fischendler, that uh, was the main reviewer of the whole uh, joint policy study. He's from the Department of Geography in the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And we'll start a dialogue with uh, Elizabeth Yari from uh, the Stockholm Water Institute, right? Uh, uh, in regards to the paper and in general about the different uh, um, similarities that we can see in between the, the, the pandemic, the process of securitization, and uh, the, the ability to ensure water security in the region. So please, Professor uh, Itai Fischendler, uh, stage is yours for the dialogue session. Okay, I, I will be very brief because I guess we all have a lot to digest. So let's start with the process. Do, do you hear me loud and clear? Guys, do you hear me loud and clear? I hear you clear, not so loud, but uh, okay. because I know you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start with the process. So first I would like to apologize for being such a pain in the neck because we have gone back and forth with the chapters and we have been trying to align them to the requirement of the European Institute. And this ping pong process has been very challenging for all of us because as you all mentioned, the concept of water securitization is very elusive. It's not always clear by what do we mean water securitization. We often tend to treat it as a, as a, as a deterministic issue rather than a, rather than a, than a social contract where we decide how to communicate the situation. And we have been asking throughout the project a few questions. We have been asking questions like, why to securitize water? How do we securitize the resource? Who are the stakeholders that tend to securitize? And mostly <clears throat> the pros and cons of securitization. So just a few take home points about the process, what I have learned from your wonderful chapters. I think we've seen that water securitization is part of a wider phenomenon <clears throat> of natural resources secu securitization. And we have seen how Julia demonstrated us that, water, that resources like food, energy, and water are intertwined, and they all tend to be securitized. Also, we've seen that the process of securitization is a man-made process, and it's not a given, and did not come down from Mount Sinai. As such, we have learned that stakeholders decide how they wish to portray the situation on the ground in terms of water availability or pollution. They can do it in a technical manner or in a political manner, and of course, through securitization rhetoric. Uh, as, always, as often has been done in the case of Israel and Turkey, and of course in the case of Gaza, as uh, Julia and Mahmoud demonstrated. Also, we have seen that each approach has its own advantages and disadvantages. We have seen how securitization brings the heavy artillery, how it brings attention, the involvement of high politicians, as Ali demonstrated in these two wonderful case studies but also we've seen how it excludes communities. And I challenge each one of you to try to get protocols, minutes, groundwater negotiations in the Jordan, 
on Gaza or around the Red Dead Canal. I've been trying to do it through the Freedom of Information Act, and I never succeeded. Another question that we tackled is the question of who. Who are the usual suspects that will secure the water? And we've seen that quite often it is high-profile politicians, but not necessarily. We've seen that quite often it is even grassroots or grassroots organizations that seek to securitize the resource in order to bring attention and resources. And I think Ecopis is a great example of how they use securitization in an instrumental manner to bring resources, but at the same time, they also desecuritize de whenever they discuss the issue with local state stakeholders. And finally, we have seen, we got a flavor about the question of how do we securitize, how we discuss it in an in in existential manner, how we all use the doom and gloom rhetoric, how we give mandate to national authorities, how we use language and metaphors like no return, tipping points, and the other linguistic tools to securitize. And finally, I think we have seen a bit about questions about the timing. When do we securitize? And I think the Sina is right. We securitize whenever we feel that it is right. Whenever that we have a, a gut feeling that the public would accept it. Whenever there is an, an, an emergency situation. Uh, and of course, it relates to our unfriendly virus and the, and the opportunity, and the crisis opportunity that may legitimize further securitization. But at the same time, I think there are still a few open questions which we haven't answered. Questions like <clears throat> once we securitize, can we go back? and switch to a different discourse, like a political or, te or technical discourse. Another question is, aren't we emptying the concept of securitization by securitizing again and again and again? Can we imagine a, situ a situation that everything becomes securitized? So how can we prioritize between competing securities? Obviously, we can't. And I think the biggest question is, is still unclear to me whether securitization brings cooperation or conflict. And throughout the process, we have seen how it can do both. How in the case, for example, of Israel and Turkey, it can bring into an agreement, maybe versus other cases like in the Jordan, especially in the past, how securitization has brought the great work. So this is what I take on, and it's quite a lot to digest. And now I would like to bring the, to be, give the floor, the Zoom floor, to Elizabeth from the Stockholm International Water Institute. And Elizabeth is much, is very much different than I am. She's a practitioner. She's engaged with policymakers and uh, stakeholders. So I'm sure that she has a, a refreshing perspective on securitization. Great, thanks, Itai. <clears throat> um, first of all, it, it's really a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Um, uh, up until last week, uh, I, I was unaware of this amazing work that you all are engaged in. Uh, so it's really exciting to hear all these different perspectives, fresh perspectives on, on water security and what it means uh, for the region. Um, I was asked to kind of share some reflections and uh, perspectives from how uh, the Stockholm International Water Institute engages on the issue of water security and some of our practical applications in a couple of different uh, basins considered conflict sensitive basins globally. I, I do have uh, like six slides. I'll, I'll put them up uh, if you just allow me. Oh. Hold on, I thought that would be easier. Here we are. Okay, do you all see these slides? Great. Um, I will I will skip past some seaweed propaganda only uh, to indicate that we're a Swedish water policy think tank uh, with offices in Stockholm and Pretoria. 
For those who don't know us, uh, a lot of people know Seaweed because of the World Water Week, which convenes about 4,000 water practitioners and decision makers annually. Uh, a really important to maybe mention now is that we do have a department in addition to the department I come from, the Transboundary Department, we also have WASH and Water Resources, and I'll circle back to that at the end of our presentation here. Um, I'll just put a pin. Uh, Itai mentioned that we are kind of practitioners engaged in various types of water diplomacy activities in various different uh, basins around the world. You can see on this slide a map of the engagement areas that we are currently involved with. That, that's primarily the Nile Basin, Euphrates, Tigris, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and some exploratory engagements in the Jordan. All of this is under the umbrella of a program called Shared Waters Partnership, which is a program mandated by Sweden, the US, Norway, Netherlands, and UNDP to support water dialogues in very conflict sensitive uh, basins. Uh, and we also host this UNESCO Category 2 International Center for Water Cooperation, which is a research institution within CWE focused on water cooperation. So you kind of hear my perspectives coming from those two kind of the research as well as the practical engagement. When I was asked to kind of share some reflections on water security, uh, of course, we have to kind of come to a shared understanding of what that means. And, and I won't actually walk through the slide because I think Christiane uh, really highlighted some of these key aspects already. But in our mind, when assessing a basin in terms of water security, the question is whose security? So that's already been brought to the fore in this discussion. There's various different par paradigms around security traditional security challenges around state to state perspectives, as well as the human security perspectives. And pushing that further, we really want to see assessment around planetary security. So before engagements in any um, basins uh, from, the, from the CWE Shared Waters Partnership perspective, we're really doing the security assessment from these three perspectives, the state to state uh, traditional security paradigm, human security, what it means for especially vulnerable communities, as well as this uh, planetary security perspective. Um, I'll just uh, hi highlight now before I dive further is that um, a lot of the ideas that are presented in this little intervention today are part of uh, a chapter in the uh, Rotledge Handbook on Middle East Security. And my colleague, uh, Martina, Dr. Martina Klimas and I wrote the chapter on water security in that handbook. So if there's more, you can dive in there. Um, in our assessment process, water security and the lack of it can be regarded, regarded as a conflict indicator. Uh, the bottom kind of foundational lesson learned here is that inclusive processes build, build longer lasting sustainable outcomes and contribute to mitigating conflict relapse, which of course is uh, a huge problem inside uh, various different water uh, co conflicts and, and cooperation schema. The response is always extremely context specific and I, I can't highlight that really enough. And I think we see that in the COVID discussion as well. Uh, in, uh, but the one kind of process that we've seen over and over in multiple different basins is that increasing the linkages uh, increases uh, water security. So increasing the linkages horizontally, we say between fostering greater interministerial coordination and cooperation. So that's at the national level. And we have great examples of countries that have uh, increased coordination and linkages across ministries involving ministries of foreign affairs, uh, ministries of water and other line ministries related to water. So broadening the discussion at the track one official level water process. Vertically, you can also move uh, uh, examine this issue by looking what are the linkages between the informal water diplomacy or water security dialogues and the formal discussion. So we know that increasing those vertical linkages between informal pro pro uh, processes like those uh, that are being led uh, by the ARVA and track two processes, uh, ECOPs and other examples in the region are really essential, but the real trick is the linkage to the formal discussion. Uh, this is a, a image that we use in capacity building uh, programs for water decision makers in conflict sensitive basins and it's really to demonstrate the importance of fostering linkages between the formal level and 
the informal level. And by doing that, we create new shared perspectives and shared information. And I like to put this list of water challenges uh, on the side. These are typical uh, examples of uh, issues that are addressed by river basin organizations or bilateral commissions uh, dealing with transboundary waters. And you can see water allocation is on the top of the list and that's not by accident. It's quite conventional, particularly by state actors in the Middle East uh, that water dialogues on the formal track one level have quite a focus on water allocation. And to me, that's one of the, the <laughs> looking at it as an opportunity for engaging other perspectives in these discussions is really about elevating some of the other important water issues on this list as well. Um, it's also uh, generally notable that multilateral processes are advanced in basins where there's greater symmetry and power relations and a deeper understanding of interlinkages between uh, the, of, around the benefits around cooperation. Uh, in the Middle East region, as elsewhere, power asymmetries at the political level contributes to the tendency of track one official level processes to advance bilateral agreements. So kind of a generally we're seeing bilateral agreements uh, focused on water allocations on the formal level. And uh, when there's stronger linkages to other types of actors, uh, so beyond security actors, we have opportunity to engage other perspectives and other priority issues. Um, so I, I think uh, our perspective on, on some of the uh, issues that you have all elevated in your chapters is that security perspectives are, are of course key to be around the table. Uh, but the concern is really that when the discussion shifts exclusively into this security domain, this detracts from other perspectives and erodes key principles of inclusive water governance, I, uh, specifically transparency, accountability, and participation, which are really critical to solid, uh, effective water governance. Um, a last point really of caution around the securitization framework is that it elevates the threat framework. And I think Ali, you mentioned this earlier uh, as well um, in your own words. And this uh, elevation of a, a water security as a, um, as a threat is it has some concerning fallbacks. And I think we have to examine that over short-term benefits and long-term impacts. Uh, of course, we are cognizant that negative information is considered to be more salient to decision makers in the short term. So we, it, it's important to understand that when we leverage uh, that threat framework for the, the purposes of advancing additional cooperation. Of course, there are many benefits of enhancing the linkages and broadening the discussion beyond security. Um, I, I, I should have started my timer because I don't know how much I've been talking, uh, but I will just mention uh, a few examples. For example, this issue of strengthening linkages between political and technical. Uh, Afghanistan is a great uh, example of this where we see a strong national coordination involving a broad uh, sector of government agencies involved in the transboundary dialogue. This enables really important perspective to come to the fore and the uh, process of desecuritization of water. Uh, we also have many other examples uh, around the changing of attitudes when the space is broadened and other actors are able, civil society actors are able to enter into this uh, official level water diplomacy space. The real message is that our concern around the securitization is that it uh, drives the discussion into one uh, public sphere instead of fostering water championship across a really broad space, which enables more people to play a role. Um, I will highlight a few intersects from our perspective on, on, on with regards to COVID-19. Um, I think that some of the other speakers have already highlighted this issue of emergency measures and concern about rolling it back. Uh, in, the, in Sweden, uh, where we work, and in the EU generally, there's a very broad uh, discussion going on of, as an opportunity for sustainable transformation. Uh, and that is uh, one side of the discussion. In other countries, we see uh, uh, more insular discussion and closing of borders. Uh, but I think there's some real positive things that we see in, in the COVID response and uh, we see in water diplomacy uh, processes as well. And that is 
cooperation, coordinated decision making, data sharing, increased transparency of data, interministerial task force. All of these have contributed to the, uh, to the flattening of the curve across the world, but are also tools in the water diplomacy toolkit. So it's a nice parallel there. Uh, my final remark is really that uh, water and sanitation has come to the fore of public awareness through this process. Of course, we all know that we should wash our hands regularly, and that really uh, is based on the assumption that we have uh, water and sanitation in our homes. But we also have to remember that according to UNICEF's 2019 assessment, about 40% of the global population does not have water and sanitation facilities in their homes. So this in, does not enable them to follow the uh, WHO guidelines for response to COVID. So we have seen a kind of shift inside seaweed and shift in the water sector generally to make sure that we are all wash, uh, all behind our water and sanitation colleagues. And bringing that wash perspective into transboundary is something that's very limited. So I'll just uh, end with this idea that uh, as transboundary, uh, you know, we saw this list earlier in my presentation of key issues, uh, water uh, sanitation issues in terms of in the household level are not really on the agenda of transboundary water decision making dialogues. Uh, and that's something that we will see more and more of. Uh, so we need to grow some kind of uh, so increased capacity with regards to wash inside our river basin organizations and committees and commissions. Um, and, and that is my point now, but I'd be happy to circle back in the, in the questions and answers. I hope that this was a valuable contribution. Thank you very much, okay. Elizabeth, and thank you very much, Professor uh, Fischhandler. Would you like to respond to a point, or we'll open up for uh, questions that we have from the audience? Well, I think we've, 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 we've spoken enough now. Let's hear the audience. <laughs> Great. So I, uh, I have a question here from... No, I, first of all, we can start with a comment from uh, Mr. El Mortaz Abadi. He's a managing director in the Water Department of the Union of the Mediterranean, uh, General Secretariat. And he's here with us uh, in the panels, and uh, I will be happy to hear his uh, comments and questions. Then we can open up for uh, for the attendees, and of course for if us if we have uh, comments for each other. Uh, so please, El Motaz. Okay, Leal. Thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting us at the Union for the Mediterranean to take part. It was a short notice, but absolutely we are very happy to be part of this. We've been uh, following you great work during the last year here in Barcelona with IEMED conference and uh, EuroMedSec. Absolutely, as an intergovernmental organization in the Mediterranean, the soul of our work is the regional cooperation, is to, mirror, uh, to work together to bring governmental and civil society to work together in order to address our challenges. As you know, as you stated now as a scientist, that the Mediterranean region and the MENA region are the most scarce water resource country as well as in our definition at the Union for the Mediterranean, it also recorded that it's also facing a water shortages. Because when it comes to the water shortages, and our perspective is related to the man-made aspects, related to the lack of uh, good governance, lack of regulation, lack of uh, setting up a good responsive government and uh, multi-sectoral approaches within how tackling the water and energy sector and to achieve water security. And the other part, which is the na natural reason, which everybody knows about water scarcity, as well as uh, it comes to the climate change and shortage of the resources. And uh, everybody knows that in the Mediterranean region, uh, many of our countries are listed on the uh, 10 poorest uh, country in terms of water resources, as well as the other challenges that you know. In the Mediterranean region, luckily that we have now a framework of action to enhance cooperation, to enhance policy recommendation among the member states. Uh, the principle is to do more by exerting less, by exchange knowledge, exchange experience, and uh, replicating success story. These policy recommendations that you came out are very uh, in line with what we are looking at at the Union for the Mediterranean in terms of the UFM water agenda, which was approved by the 43 member states. 
by the Palestinian, by the Israeli, by Jordanian, by Turks, by Lebanese, Leba and French, Spain, and all other 43 UAFA member states. Water energy, uh, food ecosystem nexus is in the soul of the work. So the Union for the Mediterranean was working with the partner like JWB, Med, Med and CIDA in Jordan and in uh, Albania and other in order to ensure sustainability between the, these sectors. So uh, the recommendation coming from Julia and other colleagues are very, very important for us to be tackled, especially when it comes to the study that mentioned by all of you, Gaza. Gaza Strip, uh, one of our main projects at the Mediterranean here is the Gaza desalination, desalination facility. We showed a very good example of uh, cooperation even I, I am Palestinian, I know how much it is difficult, uh, the situation over there. And, but at the end of the day, there is nothing have consensus more than this project. Everybody from uh, all government around the Mediterranean had supported this project politically, financially, and now uh, uh, it's uh, under implementation. Luckily, that, uh, that this project will see the light soon. Desalination is a, is a solution for the water scarcity. Meanwhile, a good governance and good management is the uh, answer for the water shortages. When it comes to the COVID uh, things, and here I will end, the Union for the Mediterranean, we are uh, taking the lesson learned from it. Uh, we cannot solve the problem uh, if we don't uh, manage uh, wash and the nexus between water and public health and hygiene. Uh, you address it very well, but at the same time, we uh, classify at the Union for the Mediterranean our policy paper that published at our website that we had to work in two phases. The first phase at the emergency, how to ensure that water are at essential services provide the, provided with all means in order to ensure that uh, people receive these services because this is the first element to fight this hidden enemy, the virus, is to wash your hand, and that means stress on the water supply to the uh, cities and villages and to the community centers, as well as the other concern that we are now working with the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission and other member states by holding a series of uh, consultations, which is uh, uh, the infiltration of this virus to the wastewater, considering that the nexus between water uh, and uh, food. Many of our member states are using the treated effluent and that uh, need to be investigated. So our goal uh, in our uh, website to our member states that we have to, to follow WHO standard and we have to follow the national uh, regulation when it comes to the disinfection because some other uh, result came that this virus is very fragile to the normal disinfection and the normal disinfection that we are using at the, the wastewater treatment plant. With this, I am very happy to be with you and to share with you. I am already receiving information to have a follow-up email with Shira and the team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, El Motaz, uh, for your comments. I think it was very important for proceeding. I uh, just have a, have a general question, but I think it's aimed more to the practitioners. It's Elizabeth and Julia, and it's we're speaking a lot about securitization and the centralization of the government uh, in, uh, in making decisions regarding water. And I wonder about the ability of civil society to shape these policies. Uh, I know Julia and Elizabeth have years of experience, both in international level and local level. And I wonder uh, um, about your insights in regarding what's the best way of doing it. Uh, maybe like specific uh, actions that you took that were more successful than the others, or maybe even specific forums that can put some pressure on the local governments to open up to civil society. So I wonder from your experience in regarding how we through our steps can manage to bring the civil society into the room that which we learned that is uh, very crucial in, in, in making stable and sustainable uh, process in regards to water security. And then we can open up to other questions. And I invite all attendees to write questions if you have in, in the chat box. Liel, should I go ahead? Yeah, please. <laughs> Julia, do you want to start? I'll follow after you. OK, um, I, I, it's, a, it's a great uh, point, uh, Liel. Um, in our kind of practical experience model, we're doing analysis 
we're identifying entry points and ripeness. Uh, and we're looking for how the engagement strategy might be implemented. And, and that once you kind of get the pieces in a row ready for that engagement, we're, uh, in terms of civil society engagement, we're, we're doing capacity building for civil society so that they can have a eye-to-eye -eye discussion with the governmental officials in many cases. Uh, and, that, and then there's a, com a process of fostering a common issue agenda what are the priorities of the civil society actors and how they relate to the national agenda. Uh, and then it's a process of identifying joint activities and actions that can be implemented jointly between civil society and governmental officials. So fostering the linkage, um, we often say, I, I, and I know so many of you are working with contact theory in terms of bringing communities together. Uh, it's not necessarily enough to bring people together, but the joint action is really essential in order to create a space where people can jointly carry through a shared vision. Uh, so that's kind of our conceptual practical process. Um, if I think about examples of engagement of civil society, I, I mean, I, I, I just had a meeting yesterday with the Women in Water Diplomacy Nile uh, group, for example, uh, and in that group, uh, this is primarily governmental officials, but there are some civil society voices engaged and it very much, um, it, it changes the official discourse. It influences the discourse when you bring other perspectives, other communities into the uh, discussion, when you foster those linkages to the formal uh, network, new issues come to the fore, new opportunities, new opportunities for joint action take place. So that, that's my little two cents on this question. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Julia, do you have any insights? So I think this is a very important question. and. Uh, we at Ecopis, we have developed a model for uh, trying to uh, engage with different stakeholders and create this bridge between the civil society on one side, uh, which is com composed of different actors. So we have the academia, but we have also a non-government organization and different groups, youth, religious leaders, and on the other side, the government. And we have understood that if, we, if this connection, if this bridge is not working, then uh, the work that civil society does cannot really have an impact if it's not um, recognized and then uh, by the governments and if governments don't act upon this, uh, this, uh, this uh, push uh, received from the civil society. So one of our uh, strategies is, first of all, and I, and I saw this also in Elizabeth, uh, uh, presentation is create this shared knowledge. So starting from a space where data is um, uh, agreed by the different stakeholders that are in place. So this is very important to create uh, a, a sort of um, a sense of ownership towards that, uh, that research, that report that uh, we present to governments and we pre present to the, to, the, to, the, to the public, to the audience. Uh, to do so, it's important to uh, create processes that involve different stakeholders from the from the inception. So we are not uh, all, we're not go, uh, coming to the government saying this is our solution, please implement it. But we involve the government from the very beginning. It can be challenging, but this is a very key element of our work. Uh, another important element is also to make sure that the public is informed because government responds to their voters. So it's important to, to make sure that information is shared and is, is shared through media. And this can create uh, opportunities for pushing uh, uh, the governments to act. Uh, one, for example, uh, way that we, we, we work uh, is to engage, for example, with local authorities. Local authorities uh, constitute that uh, uh, element that, that is at the gap between national decision makers and communities. So uh, uh, by engaging with mayors, with uh, head of regions, it, we, we create that, we, we, we created that connection. Uh, and I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that civil society uh, can bring a new perspective, can bring different actors, so involving, for example, so the private sector and, and different other actors, uh, ensure that the communication continues and uh, uh, we, we, we try to, uh, to target the governments through different um, angles. Uh, and I think this is uh, the key for, uh, for creating space uh, through uh, the, the, the civil society engagement. 
Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you also, Elizabeth. Uh, this is definitely a running theme of a kind of a question in terms of methodology, methodology, excuse me, and operationalizing these concepts we're thinking about. So the role of local community, this track 1.5 being municipalities and how do we empower them? And also where's this pressure acupuncture point of upscaling this so how do we create a coalition of civil society or a coalition of local communities so that really the impact starts to be felt in a more regional or um, uh, coherent way um, so i'd like to share now with all the panelists we have uh, a couple of questions so i'll read them both out um, they're there they have a nexus between these two questions and then i'll ask uh, some of the panelists um, here to respond. So this question is from Vakur Sumer. Uh, I'll just read it out so um, to uh, give credit to the person asking. Thanks uh, to all the presenters with their rich talks and also to Dr. Derios who invited me to this great group. In light of COVID-19 related disruptions in supply chains, many countries are now concerned more than ever about self-sufficiency and food production. So this might translate into more water wasteful farming practices, particularly in water scarce Middle East countries. In turn, this can exacerbate already dire water scarcity levels in the region. We should also add the increased urban water consumption due to increased hygiene awareness. Can uh, the panelists, presenters, elaborate on the food security or food sovereignty, sovereignty, so to speak, dimensions of the nexus? Because global trade in food was a relieving factor in dealing with water scarcity in, reg in certain regions, particularly in the Middle East. Um, so in brief, can COVID-19 defy all the benefits we have here there to uh, harness from virtual water transfers through international trade. So that's, uh, I will read them both and then ask you to respond collaboratively. Uh, and then the second question is from Mustafa uh, K. Maz. Thank you all for your insightful analyses. My question is regarding the sense of common challenges leading to a cooperation at the state as well as societal level. Do you see the potential for such shift from competition and rivalry towards collective action? So again, uh, are we looking at conflict or cooperation with this uh, current crisis and particularly focusing on food supply and agricultural practices? Who would like to respond? Yes, please, Dr. Ali. Um, hello, uh, good afternoon again. And uh, uh, I don't want to speak for any of the panelists. I'm not the expert on the nexus. However, I have um, I have prepared some general answers. Um, uh, first, on, uh, on um, Mustafa Kaimaz, basically, um, yeah, it could be. It's not. It's not very straightforward under these conditions for um, cooperation to occur automatically. I mean, yes, there are the conditions. Yes, there is a situation of there is a crisis situation, and we expect all of humanity to uh, join forces together. Well, you need some channeling goal, uh, some leadership. It's not right now. We're not seeing it maybe at the desired level. Doesn't mean that it will not happen. But uh, my, my in my chapter, I try to highlight a more enhanced role for um, civil society as the driver, as the gatekeeper for this uh, to mobilize society alike so that's for my answer my take on mustafa's question and for uh dr vakur sumar um um and i can only answer part of his questions because it's not all within my expertise but uh i just want to um stress that you know water resources are currently they were always critical but right now they are at such a critical level. I mean, oil price, the demand for, for all energy forms fell except for renewables. And guess what? Hydro is in that as well. So, uh, and for just for washing hands, for hygiene, for sanitation, water is even more uh, crucial and critical than it has ever been. Uh, and this, there's the fear, of course, that many nations might be motivated to control. However, and um, I already sent him the written answer, by the way. I'm just gonna go over that very briefly. Um, environmental awareness uh, 
has increased, not only at the society level, but in government, uh, but also at governmental level for some, not all. For, for many, but not all. We also see the reverse, the protest people. Some governments are trying to downplay the, the crisis, but for many, this has uh, increased. And now we see an opportunity because many governments are now more concerned about the environment and many businesses and many in society know that they will need to go through this business transition. They need to develop agribusiness, but not just in a wasteful way. They, they would probably need to develop in an environmentally sensitive way as the, as, their, as the consumers become more environmentally aware. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity for civil society to mobilize government and businesses as well as uh, uh, the other, um, um, the other uh, segments of society to promote good agricultural practices including not wasting water resources. But that's a partial answer I can, I can have. As for the food, I think that's someone else's expertise. Uh, any other panelists wanna add to that? Floor is open. Yep, Tobias, thank you. Yeah, maybe just a short uh, comment. Uh, I think under the, in the context of COVID-19 now, um, the question whether a certain water setting can move from competition and conflict towards collective action and collaboration, um, uh, the key, a key currency here is trust. And the trust uh, among the um, stakeholders involved, be it on the state level, be it on the community level, so it's not so much, uh, it doesn't differ that much from the pre-COVID-19 uh, period. And uh, I think that in other policy fields over the last uh, month, we have seen that it, there is an opportunity, yes, and in certain realms, it worked out that uh, trust uh, has been built, while in others, um, let's say, some uh, levels of trust, uh, yeah, had already been, yeah, Get, just got lost um, just got lost the trust was lost and also uh, put at risk at least in uh, in a certain in certain contexts thank you unfortunately at the Arava institute we often say the trust is the most the scarcest commodity in the middle east so you're touching on a very salient point but also something that we've recognized over the last kind of uh, period, the crisis period about uh, how much potential there is to really uh, work, invest in these trust relationships. I have one more question that just came in from Anthe Brumer. I apologize for my mispronunciation. So um, again, thank you for your presentations and insight. This is more of a comment and food for further discussion. So uh, we're encouraging the panelists to uh, respond anyway. There is value in the concept of securitization for attracting attention and bringing issues to the forefront. However, for politically and socially sensitive issues like water, we need to be super attentive to the counterproductive effects of securitization, including the shift to more nation-centered measures or the cost slash fatigue from keeping a topic at the top of the priority agenda. The global community has tried hard to neutralize the water discourse, also through regional political initiatives and processes, including the Union for the Mediterranean. The role of civil society cannot be stressed enough. However, securitizing an issue often enough transfers the lead to government and formal state structures. The balance is uh, delicate and we need to stress adequately also the benefits slash merits from desecuritization, especially when emergency situations like currently with COVID-19. Um, so I think this really highlights a lot of the most salient points that we were raising. Um, and I think as a broad coalition now, uh, including all the partners and uh, attendees here, uh, operationalizing these issues. And as Elizabeth mentioned, very contextually or context specific is really the challenge at hand. So recognizing the delicate, uh, uh, the delicacy of these issues and the merits, benefits slash challenges is really um, a question that I put to us as a broad, um, if I may call ourselves a coalition or some form of platform that have come together around these issues. Um, anyone else wanna comment? Yeah, Christiane, thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, I think that that really brings us sort of full circle to the beginning, doesn't it? Um, uh, and I, it also brings us back to one of the questions that um, Itai raised at the end of his um, uh, statement, does securitization lead to conflict or cooperation? And again, I would say it really depends on whose security is supposed to be safeguarded here. So if, it's, if, you, if you imagine the different ideas of security on a spectrum, then the national security would be um, closer to securitization processes. And then international human and ecological security would move away from it towards desecuritization. And what we see right now, I think, um, is um, with regard to COVID-19, is something that we've seen in acute water conflicts as well. So on the one hand, you see nationalization. The Middle East with regard to water is one of the prime examples for this. But we also see this all over the world right now with people, with uh, governments uh, safeguarding the, um, I don't know, uh, how do you call the um, gloves and um, the hospital um, equipment uh, for their own national hospitals, not sharing anymore, even in the European Union where we, where we are supposedly sharing everything. Not everything, but you know, being a little bit polemic here. Um, so we have those nationalization um, movement with closed borders. And, you know, we had it before with regard to the refugee crisis, etc. cetera, um, and uh, a very strong need to ensure national needs. But on the other hand, and on the other end of that spectrum, you also always have voices, both with, with regard to water scarcity or water security and to the current pandemic, uh, that see the situation as an opportunity for change. In, and in both cases, I think there is an option and there are voices who understand that human behavior actually puts pressure on natural ecosystems through land use, uh, through development, mass urbanization, industrial agriculture, extractive industries, and growing global demand for all sorts of commodities. Um, and therefore, we should or they, they voice the concern that uh, we really need to understand that nationalization in a highly interconnected world that we live in right now, and nothing has shown this in a way that the virus has shown it uh, in these last couple of weeks, um, that national solutions cannot be the solution. It just won't work. It will, just, it will only carry us so far. So I think there really is an opportunity in this crisis to show the limits of national and securitizing approaches to problems like both the virus and the pandemic and water scarcity issues or water allocation issues. I actually, if I may, and if we still have um, yes. time, I actually had a question for Elizabeth, if I may. Um, I really liked your, uh, your input. Thanks a lot for this, but I just wanted to tease out a little bit um, your view on uh, the process of depoliticizing water. And this is also related to the last question actually, or comment um, actually. Um, so the process of depolit depoliticizing water by placing water in the hands of more technical professionals. Um, and I just wanted to see or to hear a little bit more how you evaluate that. Because I see the value of the desecuritization that comes with it. Um, by putting it in the hands of more technical, less political actors. But I also see the problem of not enough, poten uh, potentially not enough attention being paid to existing power structures. And, mm. and, and I just wonder how you address this. And I'm, maybe some of the other panelists also uh, have um, insights about this, but I would really like your, your input on that. Uh, I, will, I will try, Christiana, thank you. Um, First of all, I agree with you on this idea, like the way you painted us with your hands, a picture of the spectrum of depoliticizing and the different perspectives on security that can be brought into that discussion. And I do agree with you on that, how the human security, planetary security, environmental security is a mechanism for desecuritizing. 
Um, I, I'm not uh, saying, uh, sorry if I'm unclear, that uh, you know water should be completely put into the hands of our technical experts. So, uh, I think particularly when we're talking about transboundary water, there will always be an intersect between the technical perspectives and the political perspectives uh, and uh, improving even more, including the civil society voices in that um, prism. Uh, so I think uh, important to have the technical people at the decision making table, very, very important as well to have well informed ministries of foreign affairs that are uh, fluent in water issues as well so that uh, for so for example, like a practical example when we do experience, we generally call our engagements like experience exchanges rather than capacity building since most of the officials involved in those processes are well informed and not being in capacity building. Uh, but the really it's an exchange of experience so that a technical person has a better understanding of the political priorities. So we're always in, in the engagements, we always match ministries of foreign affairs together with their ministries of water and other line ministries so, such as agriculture, forestry, it depends on the context. Uh, and so you create kind of a cadre of water champions amongst diverse perspectives within the national infrastructure. And, that, and that's very critical. And then to take it one step further is to include other tracks of uh, key stakeholders in those discussions, such as parliamentarians. The mayor's example from the Good Water Neighbors program is a great one. Um, and, and other vulnerable groups. Uh, so for, for example, uh, uh, I also lead our water and faith network where we have a faith based actors engaged in water decision making so we elevate them to be water champions I think actually, and I'm, maybe I'm circling back to a point Liel made with regards to scaling. Um, uh, one thing that we saw from COVID that was, um, I think has an opportunity for some optimism is that we all became kind of armchair epidemiologists. Uh, and very, very uh, concerned and interested in the whole public health discourse, which was not really on the agenda before. Uh, I, I, I have some optimism that if we, we construct this correctly, we will create a, a real cadre of diverse water champions. And that if we'll get the public engaged, which is really why I'm concerned about uh, too severely securitization of the discussion because we want everybody to be water champions and not only our, our, our security uh, uh, experts. So I think I'll uh, stop there, but thank you very much. I hope I addressed your question. Any other panelists want to respond before we wrap up or? Muatas, El Muatas, thank you. Oh, you have to unmute. Hello, thank you very much, Shira. Thank you, Elizabeth and Christina. And I would like to just uh, stress on the comment that made by Andy Bruma from Global Water Partnership. It's a very important comment for us. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of depoliticizing is always on the table. The issue of securitization, securitization and desecuritization is on the table. But at the end of the day, if we don't, Diagnose, diagnose, have the good diagnosis for the problem, we cannot solve it. Many of our member states, they are politicizing the water, they're considering the water as a, as a national security issue. And many, many actors and many groups in the region, they are also using water as, a, as an element for, uh, for conflict or using it as weapon. And many, they try to do it as, as a mean for cooperation. So this is very right approach to acknowledge the good and bad. So once we sort the good and bad, we can uh, move forward. There are a lot of difficulties. Uh, we face, like we said, that uh, engaging the multi-stakeholder processes. But then we found out that we need to have a, a whole government approach. Many oh. are, are not talking to each other. In one government, you, don't, you see the Minister of Environment competing with the Minister of Water, competing with the Minister of Energy. So this is a, a, another pillar that we are talking about. And we cannot go any step forward if we ignore two elements, the civil society, including women and youth, 
and we show we we see in the mediterranean when it comes to the policy aspects that those are two elements are absent i don't know if they are absent because they don't want to contribute or the policies are not engaging them so this is another window that we have to work and to enhance in order to have a broader engagement for all uh, participants to participate and to solve the issue of the mediterranean including my kids now they are going to participate to this discussion please Adam, go. <laughs> and uh, the last point we should be uh, always uh, optimistic that the the cooperation can yield a very good example and if you look at our website at the union for the mediterranean absolutely you will find a very good flagship flagship uh, examples in cooperation that we need to uh, consolidate especially at this time we need people to work together because pollution and viruses and contamination does not know border and they don't apply for Schengen visa or for <laughs> visa to enter any territory. So please keep in this in mind and we will discuss next week, Shira and the team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Almatas, I think that really is an important kind of way to bring it all together and summarize. Uh, I think it was a really fruitful conversation and uh, I definitely see a lot of follow-up and potential synergies kind of within these discussions and uh, we take it upon us, the Alava Institute and Ipkri, Liel and I to really see where the thoughts and the platforms created within this process of the last year, where are the follow-up activities. So I do want to thank everyone for um, the time taken to be with us. And we really appreciated uh, the questions uh, and the audience. I want to specifically uh, thank all the authors over the last year. It was really a very uh, dynamic process and your dedication and commitment to kind of uh, writing and rewriting and thinking about these ideas that touch upon our everyday life, but kind of challenged us to expand it to uh, new theories and frameworks. And as I started off at the beginning saying, we seem to have touched upon a really critical issue that's only going to be more and more pertinent uh, in the processes, uh, both political and environmental around us. Um, I want to again thank IE Med and Euromesco uh, for offering this platform and this opportunity. Uh, and I feel as the Alava Institute, a new member of the Euromesco and all the other members present here that it's uh, really a lot of value in this platform. So I really look forward to uh, continuing. Specifically, I wanna also thank um, Jordi and Lucas and Emmanuel, Emmanuel and Alexandra from uh, the network who've really supported us through, again, this kind of unique and crazy political climate we work in and that affects our work every day, especially when we're touching on such political issues and creating such diverse political groups. Hi, Tai-san. Um, and of course, thank you to Elizabeth uh, and Itai and Almuatas for joining us. As you say, the conversation is only just starting with you guys kind of joined on uh, now. Um, I uh, did I hope that I thank everyone. Uh, I also want to again, um, I'll put them here in the chat or wherever uh, relevant our emails, uh, Liel and I from Ipkri and Alava Institute, because these are really conversations that we're going to continue having uh, in other platforms and keep inviting you guys to be part of. I want to thank so, you, Shira. <laughs> thank you very much for your dedication you, and for everyone. your work and for this partnership. I want to thank everyone. Thank I'm sorry you. that we cannot meet, but maybe someday, somewhere, we'll all uh, meet each other and then celebrate the fact that we can meet and also the, the fact that we concluded this process together. Um, thanks again, and I uh, wish you all the best of health to you and your close ones. Um, uh, let's hope we'll pass this soon. Bye-bye, take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Stay safe, bye-bye. Bye-bye.